Persons with disabilities live among us, but oftentimes they are ignored, taken advantage of, neglected, mocked, and even spat upon. Their human rights are infringed almost every single day. On this episode of the Eye on Dependency TV series, Eye on Health, you will hear from Julia, Kenneth, and Jason, who will share their experiences, challenges, and accomplishments as persons with disabilities. You will also hear from Dr. Erica Wheeler, the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization representative to Trinidad and Tobago, about the interventions made to elevate the voices to restore the dignity and the quality of life for persons with disabilities. We're sitting with Dr. Erica Wheeler, who is the representative of Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization here in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Wheeler, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. In the past, we've done programs for folks living with disabilities, but we've never delved much into the rights of people living with disabilities. Why is that important as well? So thank you for inviting me to the program and for asking that important question as to why should we be talking about the rights for persons with disabilities. It's because persons with disabilities are persons too. They have rights just the same as everyone else. But we draw attention to those rights, for example, in the Convention uh, for Persons with Disabilities. It's called the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And this is a global convention. And all of the countries and territories of the Americas have signed up to this convention. And so we in Trinidad and Tobago, together with the government, NGOs and others, we are taking steps to implement those rights of persons with disabilities. And I want to add something else. I want to say that when we talk about rights, we are not just talking about issues of equality because you can have the same rights as a person with disability with anyone else, but it doesn't mean that you get what you need. So I would like us to think about equity and addressing it from that perspective, which means we meet people at the point of their need, whatever their disability might be. So that's why it is important to talk about rights of persons with disabilities. Today we chose to feature three persons with disabilities who shared with us their experiences and their advocacy towards a more inclusive society. And we understand that they participated as part of their advocacy in a PAHO led program to create this more inclusive society. Can you tell us a bit more about that program? Yes, I'll be very happy to tell you. I'm very excited about it. This program uh, was funded through the work that we've done with the UN Resident Coordinator's Office and as part of the work of the, work of the UN country team. Now, on the UN country team, we are working with UNFPA, the UN Population Fund, and they address things like gender-based rights, empowering people with disabilities. We had 60 participants, which included the three universities. We had UV, we had Caribbean um, University, the Southern Caribbean University. We had UV. They were also part of the same meeting with persons from uh, organizations representing disabled people and disabled people themselves. We had nine different government departments and agencies participating in it. So it was very inclusive. Uh, it was very broad in terms of them telling us their needs. So the persons who had disabilities were from different backgrounds. It wasn't all the same. People kind of think of persons with disabilities as one group. No. So we had all the different groups of persons. We had this um, session in order to actually write out the, the situation in the country to document it. And it's the first phase of a bigger program that we are doing. So we, we were really excited to talk to these persons. It's the first time we've ever done this. Also, Trinidad and Tobago was one of 26 countries that received this grant. It's a multi-trust grant. And we were chosen out of 110 countries, these 26 countries. And Trinidad and Tobago is the only country in the Caribbean 
that actually had access to this grant. So we are really excited at this work that we are working with the government, we are working with NGOs, we are working with persons with disabilities, we are working with persons who provide services for those with disabilities as well as universities. So you can tell it's a very inclusive effort. Thank you, Dr. Wheeler, for sharing with us how PAHO, UNFP, and UNCT are working to promote the rights of persons with disabilities. And now we're going to hear from three of them, Trinidad and Tobago Nationals, Julia Ribeiro, Kenneth Surratt, and Jason Clark. Well, I'm Julia Ribeiro. I am happy to say that I'm 43 years old young, and I'm hearing impaired with a severe to profound hearing loss. I was born with an 85% hearing loss. Um, I was formally diagnosed at the age of 20 months at the John Tracy Clinic in Canada. Being hearing impaired, I was taught to listen and speak with the use of my hearing aid and also to read lips. Being able to read lips is like a survival mode for persons who are hearing impaired. I have accomplished a lot in my life due to being able to listen and speak with the use of assistive devices which amplifies sound and speech. For example, in a classroom, a lecturer or teacher would wear a transmitter and I wear the receiver. So anywhere the teacher walks in the classroom, I hear that. Peers in primary school have assisted me in being able to not fall behind in the classroom. In secondary school, we're the same thing. However, in secondary school, I did not receive that warm welcome compared to primary school. In secondary school, I was bullied Due to my hearing impairment, I've been called contagious, I've been called out I'm an alien, I have gun thrown in my hair, um, but I understood why persons did that to me. They did not understand someone with a hearing impairment or someone with a disability. Somebody was even exposed to persons who had a disability. I focused on my schoolwork and I was successful in CXA. I have attained seven subjects, including the first person in the Caribbean to attain a uh, grade two in French as a hearing impaired in the Caribbean to learn a foreign language. I got an A in my oars. I remember the examiner almost collapsing. She could not believe that I'm a hearing impaired person who could speak and speak French beautifully. J'adore all the fans there. I love French, right? Um, in university, I decided to, be, because I was bullied in secondary school, I chose a different approach. I covered my my um, hearing aid and so forth. My hair was very long and curly back then. And I approached students in the right outside the building, interacting with them what class they had, you know, what's the name. Very comfortable with them. When the first class started and I handed my microphone to the lecturer, the whole class got in an uproar, saying, how could you come, come to approach us and not tell us that you were hearing impaired? I said, would it make a difference? You all did a good job interacting with me as a normal person. That's what you should do. Approach me as a normal person. I am a human being. So from that day forth, my peers were very excited to learn about hearing impairment and what I could do in the classroom. I've attained my bachelor's degree in 2001 in general agriculture with an upper second class honors. I then graduated 16 years later doing my master's degree in agri-food safety and quality assurance. I graduated with a distinction. I came top of my class in my research study that I did. It was the first type of study done in the Caribbean and in Trinidad. So I was very pleased to be awarded a distinction for it and a prize for it. Now, um, having a disability means that I can do things differently. I'm sitting here and I'm talking to you. It means that I've been, there was an option for me to learn to speak without the use of sign language. It does not mean that another hearing impaired person will be the same like me. Everybody has different types of hearing loss. Your first line of defense is the immune system of your body. Whenever a foreign body comes in like a virus, your own body will make antibodies to try and attack and shut that virus down. That's the first thing that happens. So the stronger your immune system is, the better. Well, that's the whole 
premise on which vaccines are done. It introduces something into your body that will cause your immune system to generate those antibodies that will recognize a virus if it comes into your body. I was taught to listen and speak in Canada. Uh, my mother was trained to teach me to listen to speak as well. I had to learn every single sound and words from scratch. I had to know what a toilet sounds like when it's flushing, a phone when it rings, what a sound you say, sound and water. I had to learn those things from scratch. It's not like a normal person, a baby, hearing sounds in communication and they automatically say mama and dada. My first word was car. Right? Learning vocabulary, that was the word that I picked up clearly and very quickly. I love cars, by the way. Right? And um, that could not have happened without parental support. Because doctors in Trinidad here told my mom she was over anxious. There's nothing wrong with me. Right? And so, but my family was very persistent. We got the testing done, um, the training. And my mom has said it has been a very long, hard working process. Because there are times she would go in the bathroom and cry, but she could not get me to say words like water, church, noise. Those are very difficult words for a hearing impaired person. We have to learn everything from scratch. Now, parental support, I have heard around the deaf community that they need it. Without having that parental support and family support, they would not be able to achieve their goals. And I'm a living example of that. Once a parent has a positive attitude towards their, towards their child that is hearing impaired, they can go far. One day, my mom was a person who was very persistent, always so doing research, and she was a teacher, and she was a person who motivated teachers themselves, who were open-minded of having children with disabilities in the classroom. Now, public schools did not want me. They said, we cannot have a, a child with a disability in the classroom. We are not trained to have a child with a disability in the classroom. What my mom did, she assessed the environment and she realized there were too many background noises for me to function. Probably with a blessing in disguise at that point in time. So in, pub, in a private school, even though the teacher said, we don't work with children with disabilities, we don't have no training, my mom worked with them. So she shared with them the use of my assistive device. It's a microphone, it amplifies sound and speech. So anywhere in the classroom, even when a little joke, teachers uh, were told not to go in the bathroom with their microphone on. Because Julia would hear everything. Right? It has happened numerous occasions. They didn't believe until they came down the classroom and saw me laughing very hardly. And it was like, Julia, do you hear everything? I said, yes, miss, I heard trip, trip, trip. So everybody laughed in the classroom. Right? So from that day forth, my teacher used to give me instructions to go in front of the class and tell them what to do if they're running late for class. So everybody believed that I heard the teacher. Stand for the class, give the instruction, and we did it. That the same didn't happen in secondary school. When we have staff meeting, my mom used to tell the teachers, please switch off your microphone. Julia is going to hear everything in that staff meeting. And it has happened. But I am a person, I would switch off my own microphone myself. Because I don't really want to hear what's going on at staff meeting. Right? So, assistive devices is very important for persons with disabilities. Let me give you a very basic example. I wear glasses. Many people wear glasses. That is considered an assistive device or product. If I don't have my glasses, you don't have your glasses, you can't drive, you can't read documents with fine print, you can't walk in a straight line, you can't use a computer. So it helps you to level the playing field with persons who don't use glasses. Now put yourself in the position of a person with a disability. They would need an assistive device in order to level the playing field so that they could function and show you that they are capable of doing the same things that you do, but just differently. Okay, um, the assistive device um, is like an amplifier I explained earlier. Um, I have to purchase it myself. It's about $10,000 for it, excluding the shipment costs. Um, it is not subsidized by the government, unfortunately. The hearing aid is subsidized by the government at present. And a hearing aid costs at least $18,000 for one. All right, and it uses a uh, battery. Some come rechargeable, depending on the, how powerful the hearing aid is. Because of my hearing loss, it's severe to perform, I use a very powerful hearing aid. 
right? And um, so it's very expensive. You also have to get air mold, which costs the price. I could demonstrate. This is the hair need here. It's behind the air. So this is the air mold. This is the tube. And this hair need here that has amplifiers on top of it. And there's the battery compartment, the button to control on and off, as well as um, sounds that come in. Oh, okay. Um, now, there are different types of hair needs. Different manufacturers, different quality of sound. A hair is also considered an assistive device. Now, the microphone is used in the classroom setting. The teacher and the lecturer wears it. Anywhere they walk around the classroom, I'm able to hear them. In the workplace, I use it for meetings on a conference table. I have used it to, um, what is it? In between one on one conversations, I use it while driving. Someone will wear it in the car, so I don't have to look and read their lips. I hear them perfectly at my ears. I also connect it to my phone because it has Bluetooth features. So when the phone rings, I can answer like a hands-free headset. I don't have to put the phone by my ears. I can, use, I can hear on a cell phone. Landlines, however, is very difficult. Landlines in our office, um, it's not always compatible with a hearing aid. So I have to buy an additional device that attaches to the landline and adjusts the volume. Hearing person could also use it. Adjusted the tone and volume. So when I pick it up, it amplifies it even louder for me to hear. I have to turn it back down so if anybody else wants to use it, they wouldn't hurt their eardrum. Without that device, I have to carry my hearing aid to the highest volume, carry the landline volume to the highest, and sometimes I still cannot understand what is being said on the landline. It's very difficult. And I have to be very careful doing that because if you who are hearing pick up that, Without me bringing down the volume, you could burst your eardrum. I have to tell you how long I have to carry it. Now, hearing impairment has different spectrum. So you have mild, moderate, severe, profound. I am in the end spectrum, severe to profound. All right. So someone with a mild hearing loss, you might find them in mild hearing loss. You might find them in an elderly person. Or in a moderate, it might be from somebody who has an ear infection. It could be temporary or permanent. Um, now, I'm going to share that hearing impairment doesn't always happen at birth. You can actually acquire hearing loss. Simple thing by not protecting your hearing from your workplace with playing loud music. You know, you're always screaming at someone. Over a period of time, they will lose a little bit of hearing. Playing loud music while driving in a party with heavy bass, you can destroy your hearing and acquire disability. And I'm telling you, you do not want to be one to wear, choose to wear a hearing aid. It is expensive. You are not going to hear normal like everybody else. I wear a hearing aid, I do not know what sounds I'm missing. Let me give you an example. It was only five years ago, I learned the sound of a chair. You know, a chair when some office chairs make a kind of a rocking sound, a little crack. Quick, I was the first time I heard that. That's five years ago and I'm 43 years old. Right? Um, the first time I heard uh, fan belt in a maxi. I was overwhelmed. It took me a whole month to get adjusted to that sound. Because I'm a person, all sounds are amplified. I have to teach myself how to ignore songs. Your persons who are hearing, you all do that very naturally. You know, no idea environment in a restaurant. You all could just block out sounds around from you and have a conversation. I, on the other hand, sit there and I am lost because there's too many noise around. I kind of sift out the speech. There's only so much a hearing aid could do. Right? And technology, thankfully, is advancing. And I'm learning one or two new sounds every time I change my hearing aid. Now, it's advised to change your hearing aid every five years. Right? So, and there are times I've gone beyond five years. I like to use things until it can't work anymore, completely, right? Because the worthwhile investment, use it until it can't work anymore, and it's giving me trouble, then I, I replaced it. Well, it depends on the hearing aid. As the years has passed by, I've gotten more high-tech hearing aid. I could do a little bit better, but it's still difficult. I would need an additional device, my assistive device with the microphone, to place on the table in a restaurant. It's kind of risky because if any water or stuff spilled on it, it can damage it. And um, unfortunately, I don't have an updated device because it's very expensive for me right now. If, you, if I had it, you would have been able to wear it. I could have been able to put it right here, sit around, people sit around me, and I adjust who I want to speak, 
speaking to me. In a restaurant, it blocks out a lot of sounds around. So I actually able to appreciate what a hearing person uh, experience in a restaurant. Even in a car, it's very difficult for me. I cannot drive when I'm driving. Anybody behind me is difficult to hear. So the hearing aid does, it's limited, but it helped me to what I need to do for now. Well, first I have been told I'm the only one in my age group who listen and speak this well in Trinidad and probably in the Caribbean. Um, there are more persons coming out, coming up with training, younger than me who can speak, but they still use sign language. They use the hearing aids as well, but they don't hear speech and sound as well as I do because they did not receive the early intervention that I did. I have my, my mom and myself, we have been involved in campaigns to encourage parents to have an option of doing speech. And uh, did not, uh, we didn't get that kind of support. Well, um, I have experienced it where, for example, I've heard em employers talk about, no, 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 we don't want anybody with a disability. We, have to, we can't afford to um, make infrastructural improvement. And out of discussion, I, was, I would say, well, not all persons with disabilities use a wheelchair. I'm hearing impaired. I don't use a wheelchair. Um, can I be accommodated? So the, this, it opens a dialogue because in Trinidad, we tend to think, when you think about disabilities, it's physical, which is very wrong to group everybody into one. Um, there are different types of disabilities, there are people with intellectual disabilities, there are people who are epileptic, there are people who are dyslexic, hearing impaired, deaf, hard of hearing, visually impaired, blind. It's, it's a whole wide spectrum, right? And it's very unfortunate that even in 2021, we're still grouping persons into one category. Right? It, it, it brings the question now to what about inclusion? Inclusion of persons with disabilities is very important to society. We need to value all citizens. Just like our anthem, every creed and race find an equal place. And that should also include persons with disabilities. Right? Um, persons with disabilities, I'm speaking from me, from my heart, that I love contributing to society. I love to work. I love to earn my own income. I love to be independent. I love to learn new things. Why not approach us? So it asks, what can you do for us? What kind, of, what kind of skills do you have that you could bring to the workplace? We, all of us, are very talented persons, right? Why not give us a chance? We want to work as well. Do you think we want handouts all the time? No, we don't. Do you want handouts all the time? No, you don't. So I'm, so I'm saying to you, to the public, that let us appreciate, the, we appreciate and value what persons with disabilities could bring to the table. I am a person who have worked in very various backgrounds and I'm telling you everywhere I've worked, my employers and peers feel very fortunate to come across someone like me. It totally takes away the stigma. They didn't expect someone like me could actually be competitive with them in the workplace. And I'm very fortunate that I'm able to do so and I will continue to fight for persons with disabilities, continue to adv advocate for them. Reasonable accommodation um, is examples of things that you can do to accommodate persons with disabilities in the classroom and in the workplace. Let me give you an example. For me, as a hearing impaired person, um, teachers and lecturers could modify the delivery of their course or subject area so that I could actually follow in the class and it has shown over the years for primary school and secondary school and tertiary education that modification of the delivery of the curriculum has benefited all children in the classroom. And um, also to accommodation with I ex explained earlier the use of a microphone for hearing impaired persons. Um, we also have in Trinidad, as part of the inclusive education system, we have aides in the classroom assisting persons with disabilities in the regular mainstream environment. In, for example, different types of disabilities, you can interact with those same parents as well as there's lots of information online on technologies and what you can do in the classroom for different types of disabilities. And I just want person to be very open-minded that not all accommodation is for physical dis disability. This is what I want to dispel, that myth, right? It's not a category, it's just in one category. And then for in workplace, 
like for hand paid person like myself, I would need my additional mic my microphone as well as the assistive device that attaches to a landline. As for me, I need that. But there are different support needs for different deaf, hard of hearing, hearing impaired person. There are hearing impaired persons in Trinidad that, that use sign language. They don't speak, they read lips. Their needs will be very different compared to me. I am saying any person with disabilities come to the classroom or in the workplace, open that discussion, do the research, interact with the parents, interact with the person with a disability, and you'll be able to realize that simple things could be done and they'll be able to function at a normal level with everybody else around. Right? For trying to make it become a more inclusive society, we need all state agencies to re-look at their policies to make sure personal disabilities in, are included. We will need public awareness campaign for regular public awareness campaign. We would need um, legislation, a Trinidad Tobago National Disability Act. We would need that. We will also need, in the interim, before we get the actual Trinidad Tobago National Disability Act, we would need some sort of an incentive for employers. For example, have like a tax concession or tax incentive if they will hire a percentage of persons with disabilities. We would need um, disability organizations to get more assistance to improve the level of skills training for persons with disabilities. We have disability organizations that train persons with disabilities in different skill sets to be able to go out to the, the world of work. Some start their own businesses, some, would, some choose a career path. We also need the inclusive education policy to have children from preschool to tertiary education. We will also need um, the support, improved parental support for children with disabilities to advocate for children and their rights. We will also need teacher training to sensitization. I'm, I'm aware that teachers receive training in teacher training college. They are given an elective to do. I'm proposing that we have make it mandatory. And we have given more examples of live cases like myself who are in the mainstream education. There are other persons with disabilities who went through regular schools, attained bachelor's degrees and master's degrees. We have those persons here in Trinidad. Maybe we need to come out more and show everyone that, hey, we went through normal school, we could read, we could write. Some of us could sing. I can't sing, but there are people who could do it. Right? And we have gone to school system, Policies have been there, like in university, UE has policies to include persons with disabilities in the school system. They would sensitize the lecturer, but they still have students who are not very understanding of persons with disabilities being on campus. Um, PAHOT, in collaboration with other United Nations agencies in Trinidad, put together a workshop um, to sensitize and bring awareness to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Now, me being a self-advocate and also participants that attended the workshop are also advocates for persons with disabilities, various types of disabilities, and persons who are in government agencies and so forth, all participated in the workshop. And, um, from there, they're going to have a situation analysis report done to highlight the milestones, gaps, inefficiencies, and then identify key areas that we can have a project on for the next two years. Yes, we have a lot of ignorance in Trinidad and Tobago with respect to interacting and knowledge of persons with disabilities. I believe that as a self-advocate, that we need to be more open-minded. We need to start to change the narrative of how we address persons with disabilities in Trinidad and Tobago. We need to open our minds to, to, the, to what persons with disabilities could do. We need to value all citizens in Trinidad and Tobago, all. And we need to stop looking at the person disability before looking at the person themselves. Because I am Julia Ribeiro. That's how I introduce myself. I don't introduce myself. I'm hearing impaired. You have to know my name first. So I believe we need to look at all persons with disabilities, persons with disabilities as individuals first. And it's up to them. If you have questions, you ask. And they are, they'll be very willing to share something about their disability and what things you can do, what things you can take note of in the etiquette for communicating with them. There are certain truths in life that nothing lasts forever.
And no matter how challenging things seem now, it will all pass. That the world is full of endless possibilities, and all of life is precious. But we are all connected on this beautiful earth we share together. And everyone needs someone to be there for us when it matters most. No matter who we are or where we're from, one way, one world, live easy with Guardian Group. My name is Kenneth Surratt. I am the executive officer of the Trinidad and Tobago Blind Welfare Association. I am responsible for 100 employees and approximately, well, over 1,000 clients who are blind or low vision in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, one of my goals is to start with the end in mind. And once I identify what I want to achieve, I work it backward and put systems in place to achieve it. That starts with the individual, how you see yourself. And I see blindness as an opportunity, as a journey, something to be excited about, something to enjoy, especially in Trinidad and Tobago. We have a great opportunity where there are very limited opportunities for persons who are blind. I have an opportunity here now, Head and Blind Welfare Association, to create that opportunity so the next generation of persons who are blind could live fulfilling lives with high expectation, both by the person who is blind, their family, the community, the society. So our focus is lifting expectations. So we start with uh, three core, core areas, inclusion, accessibility, and sustainability. So what we mean by inclusion, persons who are blind must be included in everything in Trinidad and Tobago. As United Nations Charter says, nothing about us without us, without us. When we speak about accessibility, is having access to information. I'll give you a little example, like the Marrakesh Treaty. The Marrakesh Treaty is an international decision taken to make printed material accessible to the print disabled or persons who are blind. Prior to this treaty, only 5% or less of all printed material was accessible to persons who are blind. So with this treaty, with the amendment to the copyright law last year, where the Blind Welfare Association got the both houses of parliament, opposition and government to pass a law to amend the copyright law in Trinidad and Tobago with a three-fifth majority. So we got the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago to unite. And in an election year, we achieved that. So hoping and moving forward, we could have printed material in accessible format to give persons who are blind that opportunity to succeed at school, life, and the job, and also in, an, in entertainment. Okay, I am blind for probably over 30 to 40 years now. And yes, there's considerable amount of improvement. And one of the key improvements what we really focus on, a lot of time people, is not that they want to treat you bad, it's just because people don't know. So once you make people aware, people are willing to help. Trinidadian are a bunch of helpful people. And it starts with the person who is blind, your attitude. Sometimes somebody might do something to you, it's not that they want to do something bad to you, it's because they don't know. So you as the person who is blind, be your own advocate and help that person and show them the right way. And you, once you try that method, it will work. For instance, let us start with the TT currency. When we launched the $50 note in 2012, I think for our 50th anniversary around there, I think, I complain about how the TT dollar is not accessible for persons who are blind. It took us eight years, but we never got fed up. And today, the TT currency is now polymer, and someone who is blind could touch the money and know the difference. Two, we have an application on your phone now. You just pass your money in front of your camera and your phone will tell you how much it is. So that is the level of achievement we make in Trinidad and Tobago. But we, ha as persons who are blind, you must stay focused. You cannot give up. I, ha I have been advocating for persons who are blind over 30 something years. I'll give you an example. That um, policy for persons with disability. We started that with Dr. Linda Babulal in the 90s. We are in 2000 and 2021. We still don't have specific laws for persons with disabilities, but I will not give up. And I see it as an exciting journey. It's to convince people, and when we achieve it, all of us will enjoy the achievement. Well, public transport is a challenge, especially now with COVID-19, where you have less passengers in a vehicle, that rising cost factor, and also with public transport where buses are not universal. What, we, what we've been asking the government to do, stop buying bus for 
disabled people separate from buses for sighted persons, let us buy universal bus. And that's another chap chapter in um, article in the United Nations Charter where you must have universal design. So bringing a bus where all of us could use, all of us could travel, and it would be so much exciting having uh, people of all religion, races, disability, traveling on the same bus, working in the same place, going to the same school. And COVID-19 gives us this opportunity and for persons who are blind on the level of COVID-19, we are having some challenges where because we see through our fingers, everything is touched. And COVID-19 made me more blind than I am already blind. So we are asking the government, please treat us special and have us vaccinated as quickly as possible. The Blind Welfare Association is here to work with the government to have this done in an organized way because Take for instance, if anything you touch, you have always have your sanitizer in your pocket to keep sanitizing. Give me a mask. There's something called facial vision. When I put on my mask, I feel more blind than when I don't have it on because your face picks up information around you. And by having a mask on, it further impairs your, your ability to navigate your surrounding. So I'm hoping that this country get vaccinated quickly and we could get over COVID-19 and get back to some level of the new normal. Even more than uh, elevated and touching, you could imagine a low vision person have to go close to the buttons to watch it. So what we are suggesting also, use QR codes. So you could put, so I could take my phone out and I could read signs with QR code. And a lot of, a lot of persons who are blind use it to put it on cans at home. So that in case you want to tell the difference between peas from corn or whatever, because sometimes all the cans feel the same way. So using the technology so you don't have to touch QR codes, barcodes, and barcode readers is important. That, and we must use the technology. The talk technology has changed my life because I could use phone, computer. I function in my office independently. If my assistant not there, I could pull out my phone, read my letter somebody may write me. I could send her emails while on the, on the road coming to work so she could get things done by the time I reach the office. So the technology helps me to be independent. And again, it goes back to universal design. We have a lot of phone companies straight out of the box. Someone who is hearing impaired could use it, who is blind could use it, who is low vision could use it. Straight out of the box, universal design. Get things in an accessible format for all of us to use. Agricola Credit Union Cooperative Society Limited introduces its new and improved mortgage loan package from as low as 5% per annum. Home renovation, purchasing a home, constructing a home. Come to your credit union today. Speak to our friendly and courteous staff. See your dreams come true. All lending criteria apply. Check us at our head office, 20 Phillips Street, Port of Spain. Arima Branch Office, Pro Queen Street, Arima. Tobago Office, Plymouth Road, Scarborough, Tobago. And or Marabella Office, Pamela's Mall, Marabella, Agricola Credit Union, your very own, working for you. Well, we, we participate in a, in a lot of workshops, especially for this period, the, the World Blind Union is having their, 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 their conference from Spain and all over the world, we will be participating where Organization for the Blind is all over. Just recently, we came out of a PAHO uh, workshop and that was exciting because sometimes I'm so focused on blindness issues. Now I'm learning about other disabilities, especially we have we've seen a lot of persons who are blind having not only blindness, that may be the dominant disability, but they will have other issues. And it is a good time for us to work together to um, help each, each other. Sometimes we have someone who is blind also with a hearing impairment. We need to deal with the deaf blind and by understanding person with hearing impairment, we could bring that help towards persons who are blind because the ones who are blind and deaf blind, they'll do sign language in the palm of their hand. So that was a great opportunity. We are hoping that um, by the time the situation analysis is completed, we could write up, um, complete the project so that Trinidad and Tobago for the next two years could focus on implementing the United Nations Charter on the rights of persons with disability and having specific laws to protect persons with disabilities. Right, so getting involved with PAHO, again, you go back to my strategy, the end in mind. The goal is to have specific legislation for persons with disability and the full implementation of the United Nations Charter of the Rights of Persons with Disability. And PAHO is that vehicle. And when they approach the blind welfare to participate in this workshop, we embrace it with open arms. And we are going to use this opportunity. And the fun thing about this Trinidad and Tobago was very special. Out of 120-something countries, 
we were selected and they only selected 20 countries. So over 100 countries were eliminated. So we need to take this opportunity seriously and Trinidad and Tobago must be the flag bearer. We must become a country that is universally designed so people could come. We have a different type of tourism where a person could come to Trinidad and enjoy our inclusive society and say, yes, Trinidad is improving. So I have that faith that my goal will, will achieve, which is building an inclusive, accessible, and sustainable society called Trinidad and Tobago. All this had a problem, went to normal school, quote unquote, because uh, St. Thomas RC in Guayaguayari. Then I went to the school for blind children, spent a little time at QRC, went to Costat, where I got my associate degree in business administration. It was a challenge, but it was fun. And the key thing here, I always go back, the person who is blind or disabled, learn to advocate for yourself. So sometimes I'd be in a classroom. I, the teacher might be writing on the board. I will ask the teacher, please, you know, if, if, if one, if you could record in the classroom, or two, a lot of teachers tend to talk while they're writing. We will have friends in class, they will take a picture of the whiteboard, send it to us, I'll get a volunteer to type it up, and that information is in accessible format so I could read. So persons who are blind, one, a teacher has over 40 children, something to deal with, students. You can't go and frustrate that teacher more. You must help that teacher and the teacher will help you. Always had eye problem, could I see before, but got totally blind at age 14, retinal detachment, went to Miami and England, couldn't do anything. But if I got blind now, because of the technology, I will not be blind. So technology has gone a long, long, long way. And um, persons who are, a lot of persons who are blind, um, well, let me put it this way, 80% of all persons who are blind should not be blind awareness like for instance the three major preventable causes of blindness in Trinidad and Tobago cataract glaucoma diabetes and Trinidad and Tobago is a our diabetic level is very very high even with um, glaucoma people shouldn't be going blind because of glaucoma we look at even cataract surgery we might we might be doing 5,000 cataract surgery a year but what we're doing is putting doing two eyes on one person what we are suggesting do one eye per person so if, say, 5,000 persons, we did, uh, did 5,000 cataract surgery, which is 2,500 each, each eye, so that 5,000 eyes, we could do one eye per person and help more people. So while we, while we give you a good eyesight in one eye, we do some, some others, and then we come back and do your, your other eye. Let us take, for instance, you have, 20, you have one person, you do they put that one person both eyes. That is one person you give back sight, and you have another person who both eyes have cataract, so you have one blind person now and you have one sighted person. If we did one eye of the person who could see and one eye of the other person, now we have two persons who could see. And when we get more resources, we do the other eye. And that's going to help because what a lot of people don't know, blindness is more than a physical disability. It is an emotional, social, it impacts in the entire community. It impacts on your family, not the individual alone. It is. As I say, the greater good for the greater number of persons. And the objective here is to have much as possible people seeing. So why should we have half of the population seen and half blind? Why we can have the entire population seen with one eye instead? My simple word, lift expectation. Let us lift the expectation of the person who is blind that he or she could be whatever they want to become. The parent must have high expect expectation for their children. They must believe even though my child is blind, my child could succeed, my child could do well, my child could live a fulfilling life. The community, the society, the politician. Once everybody have high expectation of each other, we will have a better society. But a lot of times people see the disability first and not the person. Because, for instance, you hire a mason, you didn't hire the mason with the skill alone, you, you, you hire an entire person. That person have Today they might come to work, they might not perform as well as yesterday, they might have problems at home, probably they didn't sleep well. When you, take, when you see the person, you must always see the whole person, the good and the bad, but focus on the good. When you see the person with disability, see what are the abilities of that person, not their disabilities. And it will be a different society for all of us. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And Trinidad and Tobago, we have a beautiful country. Let us keep it this way. Some of us like to play games of chance. But remember, gaming should be fun, so don't get carried away. Play for a prize, but don't pay the price. Play for fun, but never for keeps. Play smart, but never play all. Winning isn't everything. 
If you or someone you know needs help, call our gambling addiction hotlines. Rebirth House 24-hour hotline 466-3146 or Serenity Place Empowerment Center for Women 648-5401. An initiative of NLCB and I on Dependency. Okay, hello everyone. Trinbago, I am Jason Clark, better known as the Royal Chairman. And uh, I am the, the Vice President of the Trinidad and Tobago Chapter of Disabled People International. I wear many other caps. I mean, I belong to other groups. I also work under the Tobago House of Assembly, under the Division of Health, Wellness and Family Development as Social Services Officer. And I'm a, mem a member of various groups, interest groups, NGOs where we champion the cause and the rights of persons with disabilities. Okay. Right. Well, I mean, on the Tobago Social Assembly, I mean, I started working since um, 1998, uh, where I was employed under public health. And then a few years after that, now under the disability unit. And I am, it, 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 it wasn't too bad for me. I mean, I got my nine subjects from Bishop's High School. I applied. I mean, I wasn't treated differently in terms of um, being discriminated again. So, I mean, I thank God that I, I, I receive employment and from since 1998 up till now, I'm under the same division, working hard, I mean, under the disability unit where we try to work to get persons with disabilities included in society. Yes, well, in the, in the earlys, you know, in the earlys, and um, it, it, it's all in terms of attitudinal barriers, as we call it, because uh, in the earlys, where like you, I could share with you an instance where um, I, I took a, I mean, I was interested in this girl and we went to those days, it was rec cinema. And you know, while we were in the cinema, you know, taking any movie, you would, uh, a group in the back would, uh, would have been whispering, um, um, look at she, they all, uh, she and like he, she just, what for the amount of money if I could talk in terms of our, our dialect. And you know, you have those, those negative connotations and um, from the time they see you, they, 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 they figure, well, all right, it's, it's, it's because of some advantage being taken place. Um, yes, I mean, we have some some challenges I mean, in terms of physical, etc., because of the environment, and we we have some uh, accessibility challenges. But you see, that, 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 that mental, that attitudinal barrier is what we, we try to um, assist in, in breaking down, because the way perception, you know, some, some people perceive you, they might see you on a chair and figure, well, well, your life is over. You can't marry. You, have, you can't have children. You're going through. So it is, it's how people perceive. Yes. Well, my, my my fellow colleagues here with disabilities in Tobago. I mean, we the, the experience goes so far and wide. And um, what what I often say to them, uh, my my attitude, my whole approach on life, I try to instill that. I try to encourage you know other persons with disabilities not to you know engage in um like with another example again like when i was in bishop's high school i i was so respected throughout the school i mean when i came i um, in first form and uh, those guys realized how strong i was i mean they couldn't as we say couldn't come around me and and, and want to advantage or anything because i showed them the power when i squeeze their hand they say hey let me squeeze your hand and i i established that from since entering bishops and then, you know, we had one or two oh, 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 persons who went to bishops and got into fight and, and had, you know, this different experience that I, I had good experience, right, two bishops. And then, you know, I, I tell myself, it's I mean, it's because of our attitude. So that's why I often, you know, uh, appeal to our colleagues with disabilities, you know, to, to be, just, just the way how we think. I mean, we could um, end up influencing how the public thinks of us. How we look at ourselves, self-esteem. We are our own experts, our self-advocate. Yeah. Yes. During my childhood, um, when I was six years, going on seven years, I fell off a mango tree, and that mango tree up at Roxborough. I mean, I, I'm from Roxborough, and I remember climbing the tree, and I mean, stretching out to 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 get a Julie mango. But the tree wasn't so high. But how I fell, I fell sitting straight on my buttocks. And that is where the, 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 the damage came in. And even from since that fall, and I mean, my sister, and they came and saw me on the ground there and went and told daddy, 
he lifts me up, call ambulance, etc. But there was instant damage. Instant damage. Well, in terms of in Tobago, as I said earlier on, we have some accessibility challenges. Challenges with the built physical environment. And we know because buildings already constructed and even the natural topography of, the, of like Scarborough, you have Dong Tong and just to get up Tong, um, Burnet Hill. I mean, one time I little to wheelie Dong Burnet Hill and it was like a whole wow for everybody, but that's how we get around. And so we right now we need to have, uh, in terms of um, new buildings going up, we, we, we need to have, especially Tong and Country, uh, being able to to look at in terms of these new buildings going up so that we will have um, consideration for persons with disabilities, proper ramps, proper specifications. I've, I've been seeing through the Division of Infrastructure and Public Utilities that they are making some effort and we, we applaud them for that, where we see some pavements uh, I mean, putting down and they have, they have ramp and so access. But the thing is, some of them so steep that they're not doing these things with um, proper specifications. So we as an organization, the Trinidad Tobago chapter of Disabled People International, um, advocate, you know, when we have these construction or, or so to take place, that they call us, you know, we are the experts, we are the consultants, you call us, I mean, we could be able to put like right now, they, there's a booklet on accessibility building codes, um, which is available for sale, you know, I. Um, when we have all these information available, we try to put it out to the general public, to um, those builders that they will be able to build and to provide access. You know, um, and one other thing, another thing too for our persons with disabilities here in Tobago in terms of lack of opportunities for employment, etc. We, I mean, yes, we have some level of um, educational inclusion mainstreaming where we have persons who who um, we have some success stories of persons who have been attending the regular schools. But I mean, primarily we have Happy Haven, Tobago School for the Deaf and our Tech Vox Center. We have a, a, a technical vocational center under our disability unit here in Tobago where we have 30 students, where we train them. So, you know, support for these institutions where we, we could um, provide skills training and further educational opportunities so that they could be employable, not just to depend on the, the disability grant, but that they could be able to seek employment and to be more independent, to be more mobile. We have the Eldamo service. We have we have some challenges with that as well. Due to COVID, the Eldamo bus service, which is accessible bus service, is down. We want to question that. Why? So, I mean, we have things like that. We need to look up on policy development. And we are hoping that we... We, um, we are looking to, towards um, national legislation to to um, come into, you know, right now they are, they are looking at it and we appeal to the government, you know, to, you know, look at the, their policy agenda and to, to put our issues on in the front burner because we have, I mean, the population of persons with disabilities, at least 10% of the population we go by world health average. And yeah, so we need to be looked at in terms of not just policy, because when your policy is just an intention, and but we need legislation so we can have like the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The other day I attended an induction training workshop and we, we, we went into the convention and the whole structure and the need for disability rights. So I really want to give Pahu a little big up because the, the, the workshop went quite well. I was able to share my experience because I was a member of the UN Ad Hoc Committee in New York. So I was able to share my experience and we're looking forward now for that situation analysis and to encourage Paho to you know to keep on working so that in the end we will be able we'll be able to have implementation towards disability inclusion. Since we Trinidad and Tobago ratified the UN convention, we have had various workshops and a push towards implementation. I'm a member of the interagency committee um, charged with uh, monitoring the implementation of the UN convention and through that interagency cabinet appointed committee, you know, we've we been able to do some work here. We have the in Tobago, we have the Tobago coordinating committee under the my division. But I mean the, the work by PAHO, we are we are grateful. And I mean that for the that multi trust fund um, program. And we I mean we had about about forty something, fifty something persons attending that three week course. And it was so valuable, the information, and, the, and we had 
presenters who, who know what they're about. Um, we, we went into the, the, um, the UN Convention and how that links with the Sustainable Development Goals. We look at the uh, preconditions for inclusion because everything we do um, at the NGO level and even at government level too, it's all, all towards inclusion, disability inclusion. And we went into the preconditions that um, for disability inclusion to take place, we must have these uh, preconditions. So we are very grateful to, uh, to PAHO and, and was able to, to secure that funding opportunity. So we are looking forward now for the situation analysis. So in the long run, we can have sustainability towards disability inclusion. So we say big up to PAHO here. Yeah. It is very important to have a public health agency that takes that global and that regional look and not just at individuals because governments will not be able to manage a pandemic, an epidemic or anything like that if they looked only at the individual level. There are such things as what we call public goods, public health goods to be exact, for example vaccines. Vaccines are an excellent example of a public health good. Were it left up to the private sector, only some people would get vaccines, those who can afford it. But because vaccines are a public health good, it means that governments can get vaccines, can purchase vaccines for everyone in the population that needs it. So you will always need a PAHO or a WHO. Well, I'm so very pleased that you feel that way because I feel the same way. And it's important to hear from persons themselves and to know that they can achieve. They're not people that we should feel sorry for. So it just goes to show that we are really focused on inclusiveness as part of the work we're doing in Trinidad and Tobago. This is why we embarked on this project, which is a two-year project. So I really support the advocacy that's put out by persons with disability. Nothing for us without us. And we really have to remove the stigma around disabilities and think of persons with disabilities just like the rest of us who are entitled to the same human rights. So I feel that this kind of work that we're doing with persons themselves who can speak for themselves is the best way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. We just heard from Julia, Kenneth, and Jason. Truly amazing people with amazing stories. I've never met anyone, Natasha, who read lips, communicated by reading lips. This was a first for us. And the interventions made by PAHO and other organizations to provide a platform for advocacy for and on behalf of persons with disabilities, outstanding. Outstanding indeed. So folks, we hope you really enjoyed this and you've learned a lot as much as we have. Thank you very much for joining us and please stay safe out there.